What is up, guys? Welcome on into Pixwise Playbook Week 9 Edition, presented by Superbook Sports. Lauren Jabara here with Jared Smith, Tank Williams. Guys, we are like almost two-thirds of the way through the season at this point, and we saw a lot of things level out in Week 8. Jared, how are you today? Happy Week 9. Week 9, baby. Feeling fine. Um, man, we finally we got a best bet across the finish line last week. Mazel tov to us and the Patriots. Um, the Jets just – it's. They're, they're, the Pats are their daddy, 13 in a row, 33 out of 39. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll wear the shirt this week by fandom only, but the Patriots truly get the, uh, the, ta the, the hat tip getting us back on the best bet winner train. The Patriots have another big game this week. That's going to be exciting. We'll talk about that in a second. Tank, how are you after week eight? We saw some of these teams that were dominating that weren't necessarily, you know, the best rosters kind of even out both in the Giants and the Jets this past week. Yeah, I think for me, uh, man, I'm a Stanford grad, and so we really haven't been doing that well in college. So to see Christian McCaffrey <laughs> join a really good football team and then run for a tub, throw for a tub, and then catch one, that was a beautiful Trifecta. thing to see. Our Stanford fans, yeah, we yeah. Really don't have too much to care about this year. So I'll take him whenever run CMC to give me a little something nice. Love it. The first player to do that since Ladanian Tomlinson in 2004 to pass Man, for a touchdown, receive a touchdown, and rush for a touchdown, which is pretty incredible. We have a lot to get into today, um, and I want to hear a lot from our first team All-American and Tank Williams about the <laughs> trade deadline, Tank. Who do you think has made the most impactful trade as of today? Because the deadline is now set. Yeah, well, I think the Dolphins believe that well, they want to be one of those teams to be in the AFC. And so for them to go out and get a player like Bradley Chubb speaks volumes to what that mindset is to me. And, I mean, like we've talked about before on this show, like the Bengals were the Bungles until they were the Bengals in the Super Bowl. And I believe that the Dolphins have an offense that can compete with anyone. They just need to get that defense together after we've seen the shootouts that they've been in with Baltimore. And then you see the shootout with Detroit. And so getting a player like Bradley Chubb not only helps that front seven, but it also helps the back end. So I think that's important. And just for, like, symbolism's sake, um, what Chicago is able to do, going to get a guy like Chase Claypool and say, like, hey, we're not going to wait to the offseason. We're going to actually try to help Justin Fields this season. I believe that speaks volumes not only to Justin Fields and the team, but also the fan base, even if you think they might have given up a little bit too much. Yeah, Chase Claypool is a huge move for the Bears at this point. Jared, who would you say for you was the most impactful move at the trade deadline? Uh, so I, I think on defense, obviously, Bradley Chubb is huge. And I'll throw some numbers mm -hmm. your way. Third in pass rush win rate amongst defensive ends, rush ends this season at 27%. The only two guys ahead of him, Miles Garrett and Micah Parsons, who's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And that was obviously the weakness of Miami's defense. Emmanuel Ogba has had a really bad year. Uh, Melvin Ingram only playing on about 50% of the team snaps. So again, they, they needed a boost there. Um, you got Jalen Phillips, who's got four sacks. You know, he's great on one side. Now you've got Chubb on the other side. And I think that's going to mm -hmm. make Mike McDaniel a little more aggressive of a coach early on. Roquan Smith is important too, but I think that speaks more to yeah. how the Ravens feel about Patrick Queen. Free agency for, Ro for Roquan coming up, I would assume that they want to keep him in the mix and maybe Patrick gets phased out. But I'll be honest, Christian McCaffrey to me is the big splash play here. And now you get Kyle Shanahan, who's going to be a lot more intuitive with his formations because you can kind of put Christian anywhere. And they debuted this pony personnel last Sunday uh, against the Rams where they played two halfbacks, Wilson and McCaffrey on the field at the same time, nine snaps. They were successful on seven of them. So very dangerous weapon for McCaffrey now in the backfield. Who knows where he's going to line up? Is he going to throw a pass, catch a pass, receive a pass, uh, you know, run the ball. So th this is a really dangerous Niners offense already that got a lot more dangerous last week. Absolutely. I also think on the offensive side, obviously, Christian McCaffrey was definitely the move to talk about. I mean, this guy, after having one more week of practice with the team, has been absolutely fire this past week, especially when Jimmy Garoppolo didn't necessarily look like he was at his most confident. Um, on the defensive side, you also mentioned it too. Roquan Smith, for me, for this Ravens defense from the Bears is huge. Their defense needed a difference maker that is what this guy is they had two blown double digit leads late in the game in a fourth quarter it's not going to happen with a guy like roquan smith playing at linebacker he's a great tackler he's an awesome blitzer and now 
they have a really good chance in the AFC with the Bengals dealing with injuries to Jamar Chase and, and the other injuries that they're dealing with. They can make a push for the division title at this point. So I feel like that was a really, really good move for the Ravens. And I know the Bears GM said he didn't want to necessarily trade him away. He wanted to extend him and he was disappointed in that. Um, so it's interesting to see the behind the scenes of how that kind of worked out. But Roquan Smith now is a happy home in Baltimore. And I think he's going to really help that Ravens defense. What about week eight? biggest surprises because my biggest surprise still remains how bad the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are. They just cannot <laughs> figure it out. Tank, what is going on in Tampa? Man, I really have no clue. I mean, the only uh, answer that we can come up with is like, it's Giselle. I mean, that's really the only response that we have. <laughs> I mean, obviously real. look here. I started bringing stones and crystals and stuff. I'm telling you the witch magic is real. Tank. Oh my God. It's real, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Like, I mean, they were able to run the ball early in the season. They can't run the ball anymore. Yeah. We saw Mike Evans dropping touchdowns a couple of weeks ago. That offense just still looks like you can't really get on track. And then you look at that defense. The defense was one of the best ones in the league, and they're really not playing like that right now. So the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they look like a broken team. Uh, they don't have confidence. Yeah. Confidence is a hell of a drug when you're playing in the NFL. And so until they get that back, until they get some wins back and get a little bit, little bit of swag back, it's going to be tough sledding. And we're going to talk about this game later. I mean, the Rams are another team that's in that same boat. So it's interesting to see how that's going to shake out. Yeah, that's going to be a really big game for both of those teams to want to get back in the win column. Jared, for you, week eight, what was your biggest surprise when you looked over the whole slate at the end of the week, weekend? I mean, I, I think the Rams, you know, you want to throw them into the mix too. I, I, I mean, they had two weeks to prepare for a Niners defense that was very banged up. The script was very good early. 50% success rate on plays in the first quarter. Well, once that script wore off in quarters two through four, that success rate dropped to 34%. So again, that's natural talent taking over. The Rams just have the ability to get push up front. They don't have the ability to stretch the field. They miss Odo Beckham clearly, even with Van Jefferson returning. They were not very explosive last week, and they can't protect Matthew Stafford. That's going to be a fascinating game between the Rams and the Bucks this week. Uh, I wrote that game up for the website. I actually just submitted it before we came on the air here, so I, I do have some nuggets that we'll get to later on there. But this is one of those put-up-or-shut-up games. Playoff rematch last year, two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, two Super Bowl contenders preseason that have clearly, you know, underachieved. One of those teams is going to be really underachieving after this week. And yeah. one team will get some of that confidence as we move along. We put a bow on week eight and we move into week nine. We will be talking a lot about that Ram Bucks game in a second, but let's start with some of the week nine key matchups. We'll start it out in Washington, DC, our nation's capital, where the Vikings are heading into town. They're the three and a half point favorites in this game. Massive pickup for the Vikings and TJ Hawkinson from the Lions. Mm -hmm. um, they're six and one on the season, a quiet six and one at this point. They're coming off of a big win against Arizona. And then you look at the commanders, Taylor Heineke started two games. They're now two and oh with him under center. The one thing yeah. about the Vikings for me is they allow the fifth most passing yards per game, and their best win is also against the Packers, who are three and five on the season. To be honest with you, I don't really trust either team here in this spot, but the Commanders also beat the Packers. Outgained them by 130 yards. What was it last week or two weeks ago, Tank? How do you think this game ends up? Because with the spread only being set at three and a half, these are two completely different teams. The Vikings have way more talent, but the Commanders – trending maybe in the right direction right now yeah i mean we can't bury some of the things i mean because both of these teams have like some of the most major headlines that have come out in the past 24 yeah. hours whether we're talking about the tj hawkinson trade where you really don't see those interdivision trades going on yeah. in the nfl and also on the commanders Crazy. now you're hearing about daniel snyder possibly selling the team and like that's yeah. just another never that he said would never happen and now <laughs> it seems like it may be coming to fruition so we can't really pass up on those things but if we want to talk about what's happening between the white lines uh when i watched that vikings arizona game i was actually impressed by the vikings offense it seemed like everything was clicking mm. on all cylinders at least in the first half like dalvin cook was averaging like 10 yards per clip at the beginning of this game, running the ball. And we already know what the Vikings can do in the past game. But the Vikings are similar to a lot of teams in the NFL where they just can't put people away. They always seem to let teams kind of linger around to the very end and then it ends up being like these close competitive games in the end. 
And then you look at Washington. Washington seems to be playing really good ball since Heineke's been installed in quarterback because what is he doing? He's about the only damn quarterback they have that will actually throw the scary Terry now. Obviously, it's happening around Halloween, too. So, I mean, it just all came together at the perfect time. So, when I look at this game, with Minnesota playing teams close all the time, they should win the game. They should be able to cover at that minus three and a half. I don't want to risk that, but I have a good feeling that they will both go over that 43 and a half point total. So, that's why I probably laid my money on this game going over the 43 and a half. Yeah, I kind of like the over the total here too. But Jared, this line feels a little bit like a trap to me where it's only set at three and a half. They want you to take the Vikings who are at six and one, but the commanders are a team that maybe could keep it close, cover the spread, even win this game possibly. Yeah. So we dropped the futures column earlier this week and the Vikings were on the sell high category for sure. Um, you know, metrically, they're a very average team you know, 21st and schedule adjusted defensive efficiency, they're middle of the road and efficiency on offense. Kirk Cousins is middle of the road and the efficiency numbers that I look at every week. So again, not overly bad, but not overly good. Definitely not indicative of in one football team that you would expect to be much higher rated, you know, according to some of the mm -hmm. analytics. But that being said, they're winning close games. They've won five straight games and all five games have been by one score against the Lions, yeah. the Saints, the Bears, the Dolphins, whatever. and then last week oh against my. Arizona. All those games were tight. So <laughs> not exactly world-beater competition there, right? Um, their first game of the year, blew out Green Bay. Looks great. Second game of the year, managed up, got blown out by Philly. So it, it's been yeah. a very strange season. I'd say all of the last couple of years of negative uh, variants that the Vikings have had, where they just can't seem to win close games, yeah. it all seems to have kind of – positively regressed over the first eight weeks of this mm -hmm. season. My guess is we'll see it, you know, drift back to the pack as the market catches up. And I, I agree with your assessment, Lauren. I think at three and a half, I would favor the commanders here. Now that the totals drop below that key total of 44, which is the most landed on total in the NFL over the last few seasons, I would lean to the over there for sure as well. I, I just don't love a lot about this commanders team. They're also very mediocre, but I'm getting three and a half points at home. We'll see if that Daniel Snyder news actually is a positive uh, for the team. Maybe they're happy that they're gonna uh, Daniel's gonna sell it. I don't know. I'm not in that locker room. I can't assess that. But I, I certainly could see variance on on both sides of of that news. And in the Hawkinson trade, you're right, Tank. Very unique to 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 get a tight end within the division. We'll see how he slots in in week one without Irv Smith, which is a pretty big injury, I think, for Minnesota's offense. So there's some you know conflicting things on both sides here. But I would say the lean would certainly be to the home dog. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually, I think I'm going to bet the Washington Commanders plus three and a half. I'm a little Do it. nervous about Taylor it. Heineken. I don't necessarily trust them at a team at this point, but them at trust home, Taylor. they're wanting to like be in the media for a reason that's not Dan Snyder. They maybe have a three game winning streak after this, which would yeah. be pretty crazy. Oh, wow. What about the Colts taking on the Patriots after this? The Pats lay in five and a half. That total pretty low, set at 39. The Colts have lost back-to-back -back games after losing to guess what the aforementioned commanders they're looking for their second road win of the year um the pats took care of business against the jets they've won three of their last four games at this point sam sam ellinger 17 for 23 on 201 yards i think this game is going to be more difficult for him the pats do have the 12th best scoring defense they also have the most takeaways in the league and that's something that the colts really struggle with they're tied for the first team in the league for the most turnovers in terms of their offense tank do you think the Colts can hold on to the ball against the Pats or the Pats take advantage at home and cover the five and a half point spread? So this is going to be interesting. I mean, one bit of news that came out is that uh, Jonathan Taylor didn't practice today due to an ankle. I'm not sure mm. if that's just going to be managing him to make sure that he can play on Sunday. More than likely, that's the case. But, you know, it's noteworthy. Uh, I think the major thing that stands out to me when you look at this matchup is that Bill Belichick always coaches well against either rookie quarterbacks or young quarterbacks that he's facing for the first time. And so this is going to be a challenging matchup for Ellinger going and trying to face the Patriots at home. And they're still trying to right the ship, so I know they're going to be motivated. Uh, the thing where you see the Patriots being, you know, minus five and a half, Mac Jones still isn't on track yet. I mean, there's still just mm. a bit of uncertainty with that offense. They're just not clicking on all cylinders. And I believe with the Colts getting healthier on defense, we saw Darius Shaq Linda come back and made a play last week. And so with the Colts defense getting a little bit healthier too, they could keep the points down on the fat side. 
and make this game interesting. So from that standpoint, um, I really don't trust the Patriots covering. And with it being 39 points, I mean, you want to take the under, but that's really low. Uh, I would probably just try to find another game to play, honestly. Uh, but that's just my take on that. I'm sure Jared may have like a more, <laughs> a better opinion yeah. or something that you can kind of go after on this one. We'll but see. like for me, it's just like, uh, stay away. I really don't yeah, have like a really strong point. opinion here. Yeah. I really don't. I mean, when I look at it's, the point total, it's, it's the total game. Jared is so low. The total is so low. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of that too is because the Colts also fired their offensive coordinator, Marcus Brady on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, they What are they going to do offensively now? And the Colts have gone one and eight in their last nine head to head games against the Patriots. Last time I checked that trend ain't too good for the Colts. Do you lean the Pats, Jared? Do you lean the total? Maybe the under? I know it's low, but the, but the Colts at this point don't really have an offensive coordinator. Yeah, let me do a quick little thing here. I, I should have checked the uh, totals under 40 and how they do uh, so far this season. Eh, over the last five years, the under is slightly above 500 when the total's below 40. Not like a huge trend, though. Um, I, so the things that I have on this game, I – the, the, the Marcus Brady firing obviously is going to play a big factor here. And the Colts scored 17 or less in five of the eight games this year. They sacked their offensive coordinator. Clearly, they've made a change at quarterback. I, if I was Frank Reich, I'd be, you know, getting an ice pack for my ass right now because that seat's probably getting pretty <laughs> hot over the moves that have been made by the Colts the last couple of yes. weeks. Um, Ellinger played well. He graded out 13th out yeah. of 29 qualifying QBs. In EPA plus CPOE last week, by the way, Mac Jones, 21st in that category last week. So you can make a case that Sam Ellinger played better than Mac Jones did last week. And that was despite the fact that I think Mac Jones had, um, you know, a bit of an easier time against the Jets defense. That's been playing well, but let's be honest, you know, still relatively uh, ahead, I would say, Jones ahead of where Ellinger should point in his career. Quiddy pays the injury to really keep an eye on. You know, Leonard Kemp comes back, and that was huge, and I think the Colts defense played well. But Quiddy Pay is the key to stopping the run on this Colts defense. Um, and mm -hmm. since he's been hurt, that Thursday night game against the Broncos, we've gone into some of the numbers, the, it, the, the running game against the Colts. They've been a lot easier. Teams have been running on them a lot easier since that injury. So keep an eye on that injury this week. He didn't play last week. He's questionable this week. We'll know more Friday or Saturday. The Colts' offensive line has been a problem this year. They're 31st in adjusted line yards. I think it's going to be a tough ask for them to create movement against the Patriots' defense that is really good. Fifth in EPA per play, fifth in schedule adjusted efficiency. This is the strength of the Patriots, their defense, and the Colts' offensive line has been a struggle. But that being said, Tank nailed it. We need to see improvement from Mac Jones. 25th out of 35 qualifying QBs in that efficiency category this year. That's not going to get it done for a guy that's supposed to be efficient, not yeah. necessarily explosive, but efficient. So I want to see more from Mac Jones. I obviously want to see more from this Patriots offense, but I think defensively they have an edge here. Probably too many points to lay in a low total game for me. I'd prefer to be on the dog side with a low total, but it, I don't really see an edge here. So I'll, I'll pass, and, and you're right, Tank. Better games on the board this week to bet on, I think. Indy is 0-6 straight up in their last six road games against New England. That ain't great mm. last time I checked. Yeah. <laughs> what about the Chargers taking on the Falcons? Chargers laying three points here in Atlanta. That total set just under 50 at 49 and a half. The Chargers right now coming off of bye week. They lost their last game before that against the Seahawks. Um, they were taken advantage of in that game both in the air on the ground. The Falcons won last week in overtime against the Panthers. Mariota probably had his best game of the year so far. 20 of 28, 253 yards, three touchdowns, 43 rushing yards. He did have two interceptions, but the Chargers have been getting destroyed on the ground tank. They're giving up 5.7 yards per carry, which is the worst in the NFL. And then you look at Atlanta, they're like, mm. yup. They have the second highest rushing claim percentage <laughs> in the league at this point. They're averaging 158 rushing yards per game which is fifth in the NFL. Will the Falcons be able to take advantage of a team like the Chargers on the ground? And they're the underdogs here. They're getting three points with the spread. Uh, yep, I think so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this matchup, like, it's perfect for the Atlanta Falcons. Like, Arthur Smith is, like, one of the most stubborn coaches when it comes to running the ball. And now you give him, like, the juiciest matchup against the Los Angeles Chargers team that hasn't been able to stop the run for like the past, I don't know how many years, like two, three for sure. 
<laughs> and so, I mean, this is just a layup for him and the and the, the Falcons may be getting Cordero Patterson back too. Man, and that dude is mm. electric with the balls in his hands. So that'll be a game changer. And we already look at the way that the Atlanta Falcons are trending where, you know, they've scored like close to, I believe, 30 points in the past couple games. Like uh, one game against Cincinnati. Now you have the shootout that you have against Carolina. And so I feel like they're trending up on their uh, point totals with the past couple games. And then you look at a Chargers team that – should match up pretty well against the Atlanta defense where you have Austin Eckler who will be good on the ground, but then also mm -hmm. one of the most effective uh, running backs catching the ball out of the backfield. Keenan Allen should be healthy now. Now it's a major blow that they don't have my cousin Mike Williams in the in the lineup. Like, that's mm. going to hurt because he's their, like, big play guy, one that they kind of focus on in the end zone. But at, that being said, Palmer has stepped up in some key places. So is DeAndre Carter, and I really like what Gerald Everett gives him, so I feel like that will be – their larger presence in the red zone. So don't have any worries about the Chargers uh, scoring points. Atlanta's been trending in the right direction, so I think we will see a lot of points scored in this game, even though I really can't tell you who in the hell is going to win this game, but I think it should be a fun one. I don't want to forget to remind you guys that the Falcons are tied for the league best 6-2 and two against the spread, Jared. Do you think getting three points, they can make it 7-2? and two? Well, they're also 6-1 and one against the spread as an underdog. So, you know, the one time they were a favorite last week, they failed to cover. Um, as, yeah. You know, you, you, you flip that trend to the underdog status and, and they're doing even better. So I, I think there's a lot of positives to take from Atlanta. But let's be honest, that game, we're talking about this game very differently. Not this game, but last week's yeah. game, Carolina and Atlanta. If DJ Moore doesn't foolishly take off his helmet and Joel True. Pinero doesn't miss the extra point. So, I mean, that was an epic – that was brewing Bad. to be an epic collapse for the Falcons, <laughs> giving up that touchdown the way that they did. And then Carolina just, you know, kind of bumbled the game away with some special teams, randomness, and, of course, the penalty – that caused that extra point to be significantly longer. So I, I don't know how positive I am about Atlanta's win last week. I think it it, it was a win by definition, but I think there's, a some, win's a there's win. some holes. In both him. A win's a win. But this is a Chargers team that's really pissed off coming off the bye after getting their butts kicked by the Seahawks a couple weeks ago. You mm -hmm. would think the Justin Herbert McRib is as least tender as it's been all year, kind of like when I overcooked my steak in the air fryer. Maybe it's hardening up a little bit, a little bit more sturdy there at the rib situation. Um, I, I hope he's healthy. This Chargers offensive line has been really bad this year. L losing rush on Slater is huge. I, I, I don't know what Lindsley's status is, but they need him. I, I think he's probably back healthy after the bye. But, you know, Slater at left tackle has been bad. They need to get some better play there, and we'll see if the offensive line can hold up. The Chargers, if this game's played in a vacuum and the Chargers play their best ball, they win this game by 20 because the Falcons' defense just can't stop them. But the Chargers have a way of charging, so yes, I wouldn't sir. be shocked if it's close. <laughs> they have a way of keeping these games close. I'm not betting this one. I, I like your angle on the top. The, the Falcons' defense is awful, and, and the Chargers can be had in certain spots if Atlanta, you know, schemes it right. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if this one had some fun vibes to it. Yeah, the Chargers are 2-6 and six straight up in their last eight games against Atlanta, so – not mm. saying that Atlanta's going to take advantage, but trends definitely favor the Falcons in this spot. The Dolphins. But LJ, before we move, before we move, oh, one yeah. second, because I don't want to forget, and this is totally off topic, but like, dog, you mentioned cooking a steak in the air fryer. Like, I love my air fryer. Do steaks really turn out in the air fryer? I like it. I like my meat crispy tank. You're right, though. I should go out to the grill outside and get a little more flair with it. You're, I, I to, you're, your criticism there is completely fair. I'm, I'm lazy. <laughs> no, I'm, just asking, fryer, I'm just asking the question. I hit the button, and it, and it goes. I'm not hating. So you get – it's crispier and less tender. It's a little more like, you know, when you slice the meat real thin, okay. you get that crispy on the outside. But it's not, yeah. you know, when you eat a steak and it's the red meat yeah. juice. You don't get that vibe in the air fryer. It's a little crispier. A little okay. more like a hockey puck. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm all right. glad to be clear. That's all that. I need to know. Yeah, well, I clear it up. No, <laughs> I appreciate guys, the home cooking vibe, man. It's all about the home cooking. To be honest with you, I do not have an air fryer, and I feel like I am missing out on. Oh, it's a necessity, LJ. It's a necessity. You are. I okay. totally agree. Now, steak okay. aside, I think, I think the that's... other food and vegetables. Oh, fantastic. And vegetables? I think you reheat fried do. chicken, reheat yes. pizza? Oh, oh absolutely. Wow.
Fantastic. Okay. It's like, a straight, it's okay. like fresh out of the pizza oven. Yeah. You guys have talked Absolutely. me into it. I am buying an air fryer. Yeah, that, that's the content that people want to know about air fryer flow. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, yes. Give the people what they air want. Air fryer Give money line. <laughs> you know what the people don't necessarily want is to watch the Bears play another game of football this season. They're taking oh, on the Dolphins. This season. Yeah, the Dolphins I'm not sure. are laying five. <laughs> Actually, they're looking pretty good. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, they did bad. lose four of the last five games. They did lose four of the last five. Two of though came back for the Dolphins. He, they're back on track at this point. They won back-to-back -back games last weekend against my Lions, which is really sad. But the Dolphins are 5-0 and this season, you guys, with Tua under center. He threw for 382 yards and three touchdowns last week against the, against the Lions. He is back. He is better than ever, Tank. Five points. It seems like, for me, the spread should be even more. I kind of like the Dolphins laying five here in this spot. You know, like, I'm wondering, and you guys can probably help me with this, like, is the weather still a thing for the Dolphins, like, traveling up to Chicago mm. this time of year? Like, I mean, that's I something know. I always consider when you have, like, some of these teams, like, from Florida have to go up to the elements this time of year and play ball. But that being said, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Like, the Dolphins' offense last week against Detroit, obviously they're playing against the Lions' defense, but – they were explosive mm -hmm. on all levels. And so, I mean, they're scary good. And so that's why I was saying you add a guy like Bradley Chubb. I mean, that kind of takes that team up a notch. That being said, like the Chicago Bears really didn't look that bad against the Dallas Cowboys. Like, I understand when you look yeah. at the final score, you see 49-29, it looks like a blowout. But, like, they were in it for a while. You have the Michael Parsons, like, you know, fumble return for yeah. a touchdown and things like that. And the score looks a little bit different. But – Justin Fields has like five total touchdowns over the past couple of weeks. He looks like he's trying to find the groove a little bit. And now you add a piece like Chase Claypool, like, trust me, like a week isn't going to be enough to get him fully integrated into the offense. But I at least like the mindset mm -hmm. of the Bears management saying like, OK, we're trying to improve this kid because everyone's been saying like you have a talented guy. Why aren't you trying to help him at all? And for them to make a move and a team like the Green Bay Packers, who we feel should be a playoff team, they're not making moves. Dallas Cowboys aren't making moves. Like, even if they paid a little bit too much, like, just the psyche that that gives Justin Fields, like, hey, they believe in me. They're trying to put guys around me so I can succeed. Like, they helps him. They helps the team. They helps the fan base. And now you're playing at home against a Miami Dolphins team that may not want to play in snow, may not want to play in the elements. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Even though, like, that being said, I really like the Dolphins. I feel like they're the better team and that they really <laughs> should cover. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I had to talk up the other side at least a little bit because I like the way Yeah, you have train. to talk them up a little. You got to give them a but little But this is one note, right? too, though. Like, I mean, the Chicago Bears are the best running team in the league. And that travels especially mm -hmm. really well in the in the cold weather. Like, if they want to ground and pound the Dolphins, that's why I worry about them maybe not being able to cover. Yeah, that was the one thing I was going to say, too, is, is the Dolphins at this point have given up the fifth most rushing yards to quarterbacks this season. And Justin Fields, pretty good with his legs, 230 rushing yards on 34 carries over the last three weeks, Jared. Do you think a guy like Justin Fields playing in that cold weather could maybe cover the spread with his team getting five points? Uh, that's a great uh, stat, too, because you're right. Certain defenses struggle against uh, mobile quarterbacks. Good news for everyone. I just checked the weather in Chicago. High of 70 and sunny on Sunday. Oh, wow. Ooh. So I don't think – That's, like, right that's like Miami. Miami. Yeah, that's like – that's living in the heat right there. Chicago fans probably going to be wearing, you know, you know, topless, you know, no, no, the tank tops to the game. Um, so the good news is we haven't – we're not going to see that Chicago weather just yet. But I, I do agree that is a trend to look at once we get into the later months and it really gets a little nippy out there in the Midwest. Um, but this game I don't think is going to have those vibes. Now, the one thing I think that Tangy made a really great point on, and I agree 100%, I think the excitement level for both teams, frankly, is going to be elevated. Both teams went out and made big time moves to make their teams better over this trade deadline. And that that's positive. And we'll see what the immediate impact is for Chicago and, and Claypool. I don't think it's going to be right away. You could argue that Chicago also mm -hmm. traded away one of their better players. So maybe a little bit of balance, but obviously offense rules the day. And they went out and they got a big name receiver who's made some big plays and certainly has a lot of upside. Same thing with, with, Miami, they, they needed another pass rusher. They got another pass rusher. Mm -hmm. Here's the one thing I'd like to see Miami do differently here. I'd really like to see Mike McDaniel pull out from the get-go and say, my offense is, is the better offense and the best unit on the field. We've seen McDaniel be a little bit timid early in games, and the data backs this up. 
14th in EPA per play in the first quarter for Miami this year, fifth for the rest of the game. So they haven't been full aggression early on. Now they were pushed early against Detroit down 14, nothing. And you saw McDaniel kick it into high gear, but let's be honest, the bears defense, they're not ranking that much higher than the lions defense. If Mike McDaniel yeah. wants to go full throttle from the start, Miami's offense can put up a big number in this game. And I'd like to see that happen. Don't wait to be behind 14, nothing to show me your, you know, your best stuff. Come out right away. Mm -hmm. Also, if, if you're a defensive player tank and you come out hot out of the gates, throwing it Waddle Hill, 14, nothing, you're in the lead. Your defense feels pretty good about that particular Absolutely. game as well. So I would love to see Mike McDaniel put the pedal down right away because they, the Dolphins can bury this Bears team offensively if they start hot. And I don't think Justin Fields is quite there yet. Like we saw last week, he's going to show some warts yeah. when he's trying to come back and cut into a big deficit. And eventually that game could get out of hand. So I would lean Miami here if Mike McDaniel takes our advice and starts out fresh from the start. See, yeah, you hit on some really good points because that's what we were talking about in that Pittsburgh Steelers game when they played the Dolphins. Yeah. Where it's just like, hey, if yeah. you're the better team, go and step on the team's throat. And I think making that move for Bradley Chubb and then having that confidence that they have, the way that they were able to come back and beat Detroit, I agree that maybe they should come out aggressively. And if they do, they should cover pretty easily. So is that is that your bet? Yeah. Is that you 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 would go fan? I, I would say if Mind if five? Mike McDaniel is listening to the show, you know, <laughs> Mike, hey, you Mikey, open up boy. the offense early, listen up, and 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 put it in. Then yes, I would absolutely take Miami. So I guess that's the thing. I don't know what do you think, think he will. I don't know. I hope he will. That's the bet. I, I honestly, wish. that's the bet. That is the bet. It really is. It, it honestly is. And I, and he's a first year head coach. He's still learning how to navigate some of these different spots and you're 100 right the, the pittsburgh game miami opened up right down the field i think it was an eight play drive touchdown on the opening drive and then mm -hmm. the throttle came down and then it was like right. where was it for the rest of the game i want to see that from quarter one through the end because they're doing it at the end of games pretty well but the early game so is the safer bet the over then is the safer bet yeah, the over probably yeah, 45 and a half. Okay. I, I would say, again, no weather to deal with in Chicago. And let's hope Mike McDaniel's yep. watching and they start hot and we get a, you know, a 35-20 kind of game. Hey, Mike McDaniel, make sure to check out this show, Pixwise Playbook Week 9 Edition, <laughs> presented by Superbook Sports. You love to see it. Um, Tank, you talk about teams playing with confidence like the Dolphins right now. They trust Tua. Teams that are playing with maybe a lack thereof confidence is the Rams and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They're both playing mm. under expectations this season at this point. The Bucs coming off of a Thursday night football loss to the Ravens. They've had a few extra days now to think about how bad that they've been this season and have to wait all the way till Sunday to try to prove themselves again. The Rams coming off of a loss to the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan that has the nine or that has the Rams number over the last what four years at this point. At the beginning of the season, I feel like everyone had this game circled as what could have been an NFC championship preview. Now both of these teams are fighting for their playoff lives. I mean, the Rams offense has been horrible. They rank 31st in the NFL in yards per play, and it has to do a lot with their O-line, 28th in quarterback sack percentage. Um, Tampa Bay ranks third in quarterback sack percentage too. So you can see they might be able to take advantage of that, but the Bucks, I feel like their, their advantage is going to be on the defensive side and take coming from a defensive guy like you, can Tampa Bay's defense shut down the LA Rams and maybe get back into the win column? I mean, they should be able to. I mean, a lot of other teams haven't had any issues doing it. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes you enjoy my notes, and the one note I have on this game is that if both teams play down to their floor, this could be one of the ugliest games that we'll see all year. And so I remember referencing, I remember referencing like Gary Busey's DUI picture. Like I feel like this would be something along the lines of if Gary Busey. And his DUI picture were to marry Flavor Flav and his DUI picture. You put both of those oh, together. Man. How ugly those Ooh, two yikes. pictures are. That's what this game could look like if both of these teams play down to the basement bottom. levels that we've seen. I'm rock. talking about just yeah. nasty. I hope we don't see that because at the same time, I mean, look at that matchup that we saw last year against both of these teams twice. I think it was last year where they first mm -hmm. played in L.A., and then the Tampa Bay, where those are like some of the better games that we've seen like all, all 2021, where both of those offenses were electric. You're playing against really good defenses, so they'll make their plays here and there. But, I mean, you're looking at Matthew Stafford playing some of the best ball that he's ever played in his entire life, and that's 
including the guy who played with Calvin Johnson for a whole bunch of years. And then you have Tom Brady looking like he's still 25, throwing the ball around the Mike Evans, A.B., and everyone else. I mean, that was just a beautiful. Was A.B. still on the squad then? Probably not. No, he was already gone. He had already <laughs> done the little victory lap in New York. But I digress. <laughs> But I mean, but now we go into these two teams where they just can't get right on both sides of the ball, it seems like. And so I really don't know what to expect in this matchup. Like, I don't want to kind of like waste more time than we have because I know people got things to do. (laughs) So I would just say this, that I can see both of these teams magically getting back on track on offense and scoring a lot of points or still playing ugly ball. And I can see the same thing happening from both of these defenses, either playing super high or super low. So honestly, this is a game that I probably wouldn't touch because the variance is so wide on this that I really couldn't tell you something I feel strongly about in these matchups. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how both of these teams come out in this game because both of them have a lack of confidence at this point. The Rams are getting two and a half points, though, Jared, and they're nine and one against the spread in their last 10 meetings between these two teams. Can they take advantage and make that 10 and one? <sighs> I think the Bucks win this game. I, I, if you were going to ask yeah. me the lesser of two evils here, I, I think the Bucks are playing a little bit better than the Rams are, especially up front. So the Rams offensive line is 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 an issue yeah. and what i think so starting bad. to happen here if you want me to look big picture i think the rams roster construction their strategy is now starting to rear its ugly head they've kind of robbed peter to pay paul the last few years they went after guys like von miller and odell beckham and they gave up a lot of draft capital to get those guys well now the rams haven't drafted inside the top 75 in seven years They just don't care to make draft picks. I mean, so, and again, that doesn't really matter, I think, short term. But if you elongate that trend, now you have a lack of depth at key positions. Exactly. And now the offensive line depth with three week one starters currently on IR is really becoming an issue. The Rams are getting no movement up front. They can't protect Matthew Stafford. They don't have a running game. And those things do not equal success in the NFL offensively. So yeah. to me, that's the bigger issue between these two teams. The Bucks have some injury issues on defense. Shaq Barrett, huge. And of course, the secondary is still a little bit banged up. So the Rams maybe can find an edge there. But again, they're not. But Cooper Cup's banged up. Co- exactly. Yeah, Cooper Cup yeah, on the other ankle. side. Cooper mm-hmm. Cup's questionable this week. So I, I kind of like the under here. I, I mean, I see this being like 21 <laughs> 17 at its peak. And I could very easily see the Flavor Flav Gary Busey 13 10 kind of game, too. Or, God yeah. forbid, 9 0, like we saw a Buck Saints game <laughs> last year. Oh, please so, don't put that evil I, on us. Right? I mean, don't, don't put that evil on there, us, football gods. <laughs> that did happen in a primetime game. So there are some, there's some things to, the, to support the under. I think there's some things to support the Bucks. And if you're Sean McVay, you're supposed to be the Wonderkind. Figure it out, bud, Mm -hmm. because this offense still has some weapons, but the offensive line is just – it's a sieve. And if you're not getting movement, it's hard to say that you're going to have sustained offense in this league. Sieve, 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 (laughs) sieve. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. That's what they used to say all the time to the goaltenders when I was working hockey games. Like, (laughs) all the fans would say that to the opposite goalie every time he let up a goal. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, Another one of my favorite things ever is the Chiefs and Andy Reid coming off of a bye because he is 20-3, and Andy Reid is, in his career, coming off of a bye week, which bodes well for the Chiefs, who are playing at home at Arrowhead against the Tennessee Titans. They're 12.5-point favorites, as Tank likes to say. That's a lot of points. The Chiefs yeah. smashed the 49ers the week before their bye week. Now they've had a week and a half of rest at this point. And the Titans are, at, at, at this point of the season, are kind of like an afterthought in the AFC. But they're still 5-2. and two. And Derrick Henry went nuts last week. He had 32 carries, 219 yards, and two touchdowns against the Texans. I know it's the Texans, but that was needed with Malik Willis starting in place of Ryan Tannehill. Um the Chiefs or the Titans won against the Chiefs last year. Uh, t- I think the score was like twenty-seven to three in that game. I don't think they stand an absolute chance this year. Tank twelve and a half points, though. That's a lot of points. Would you lay that with the Chiefs? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's my saying. That's a lot of points. Um, <clears throat> this one's tough because. I mean, momentum is a hell of a drug, too, and the Titans have won five straight, but those five wins are against the Raiders, the Colts, 
Commanders, Colts, and then the Texans. And when you also look at the matchup, crazy to be said, like the Chiefs used to be one of those teams that were terrible against the run. Like right now, the Titans give up the second fewest rushing yards per game. The Chiefs give up the third fewest rush yards per game. Like, it's unbelievable. Mm. And that may be somewhat dependent upon, like, some of the teams that they face this year as well. That may have – that may go a little bit into it. But I don't know if I just want to go against the Titans because I felt like that offense shouldn't be able to function the way it does because they don't have a threat on the outside. Mm-hmm. Teams know what they're going to do against them. That be said, like, they just continue to run the ball down your damn throat and win games. But now you have to go to Kansas City. Kansas City mm-hmm. has that mind, the game in mind last year when they went to Nashville and got rumped. Uh, yeah. So, man, I mean, I think that definitely plays a part into it. And then also Kansas City coming off a win where you go out to San Francisco and play one of the better teams in the NFC and you put a whooping on yeah. them like that. So I see where you're landing. Like this is, I mean, it's a lot of points. But I believe the San Francisco points. 49ers are a way better team than the Tennessee Titans. And they beat that team in their house and so now they get the titans at home yeah oh man can i really recommend betting on the chiefs with that many points do it i think i would i'll give you a reason why yeah i think yeah i think yeah i it goes against everything i i I believe but like well not everything i believe it just everything like i always like to take a sure thing but it's a lot of points, but yeah. man, it feels right. Oh, it feels right. <laughs> We're going to hit the quota for that thing. phrase in this, in this show. When, <laughs> when the Titans beat the Chiefs last year at Arrowhead, they had A.J. Brown. Their offense has gotten worse since then. They don't have as many weapons. They still have Derrick Henry. But at the same time, their offense was a completely different look last year when they went to Arrowhead and yeah. beat them 27-3. to And the Chiefs are a really freaking good team, Jared. You said you have another point to kind of talk us into laying – a lot of points with the Chiefs. Yeah, listen, I, I, I understand that it, it, it's tough when you see these big spreads, but I think each double-digit spread is is different. You know, like I don't like to just say, oh, it's a lot of points. I can't wrap my head around it. Certain double-digit spreads, I think it's fair to say it's not enough because of just how explosive the offense can be and what the matchups really are. In this particular game, I, I went back really quickly because I forgot about last year's game. And I forgot about how hellacious of a blowout that game was. So hellacious, in fact. Even Derrick Henry threw a touchdown pass in that game. (laughs) Like, that's how lopsided that game was. Right out of the gate, Derrick Henry threw a touchdown pass. And then the route was on from there, 27-3. Probably one of the worst offensive games in the history of the Mahomes, you know, Reed era with the Chiefs. I mean, that was an ugly, ugly game. So absolutely, I'm sure Andy Reid showed a lot of film from that game this week. Yeah. And that is why I don't think the the a lot of points moniker works here. Because I don't think the Chiefs care yeah. what the spread is. I think they want to go throttle up from the start, off the bot. Yeah. Now you're paying the Mahomes, you know, Reid tax here at this price mm-hmm. for sure. But I don't think there's going to be any mercy shown um, to the Titans this week. With and no is, it, is, is it Hooker or is it Tannehill? That's the key. I think it'll be Tannehill. You would think. It but doesn't I don't matter. Know how 100% he's going to be. It doesn't I don't think matter. it matters either. I don't think it matters either. Yeah, I think, I this think is you a raise a good point game. there, especially talking about how it started off with Derrick Henry throwing that touchdown pass too. Because what's huh. been some of the things we talked about on the show before? I talked about how Buffalo was on a revenge tour their matchup against the Titans last year and then the Steelers and then yeah. the Chiefs. And what have they done? They've checked a lot of boxes. I can see the Chiefs doing the same thing. I'm on board with you, dog. Hey, Chiefs going to cover. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot yeah, of points. They're going to cover. get there. Just enough. A lot of points, right. baby. 12 and a half. <laughs> Want to know what other spread is a lot of points is the Bills game. As we get into our key divisional Ooh. matchups, the Bills are taking on the Jets. They are laying 13 points against the Jets in this spot. They were laying 10 and a half last week. They missed covering the spread by the hook last week over the Packers. They won by 10. They are now 6-1 six six on the season. Josh Allen had 218 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions last game. The Jets, though, 5-3 and three after losing to the Patriots. Zach Wilson had 355 yards, though, two touchdowns, but he had three interceptions. The Bills have beat the Jets in four straight games. This on paper 
Tank looks like it's probably going to be the biggest mismatch of the week. And no Brees Hall and no Vera Tucker for the Jets. Two massive injuries. This is a lot of points, though, too. It's even more points than the Chiefs are laying. <laughs> Would you trust the Bills to lay almost two touchdowns against the New York Jets in New York? Oh, I guess the, B- the Bills mean, are also in New York, but at MetLife Stadium. <laughs> yeah, Technically, it's Jersey. Uh, a lot of heat this week with yeah. the New York, New Jersey oh, really? confusion. Technically, yeah. MetLife. Sorry, is in Jersey. In Jersey. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. They'll, those Jersey, those those Jersey boys will be upset with you, Lauren. Get that one right. <laughs> yeah. <geez. laughs> like I think uh, the one major stat that comes out of that Patriots Jets game is that the Jets only average three point four yards per carry. Like that's been their Ugh. bread and butter. Being able to lean on Brees Hall, you establish the run game, and then that sets up things yeah. in the pass game for for Zach Wilson. And so if you can't run the ball effectively and try to stay in the game that way against the Buffalo Bills, you're going to be toast. I mean, a lot of people, we were going into that game, and I heard Jerry talking about some things leading up into that Bills-Packers game and talking about, like, this is one of those things where, were you talking about maybe you should take the Packers based on the, you know, the the line on that one and that you felt like this was like a perfect setup for Green Bay and the way that they were able to run the ball effectively against the Bills, that's what kept them in the game to a certain extent yeah. until Buffalo just kind of pulled away because they were the better team at the end. I don't feel the same way about the New York Jets, and so that's why I wouldn't feel that bad about laying the points with the Buffalo Bills because they're just the superior team, and I feel like they're going to yeah. flex that muscle in New Jersey uh, this Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about your Jets, Jared, but 13 points, that's a lot. Are you betting on your Jets getting the points here, or are you kind of fading them in this spot? I would fade the Jets in this spot. So, it, I listen, mm-hmm. I, I know it's it's a big number, and it's on the road, and it's a divisional game. I, I can see there are trends backing up both sides of this. Double-digit home underdogs in the division, only about a 35% cover rate over the last four years. But recent trends – favorites of seven or more this year are really struggling 10 and seven against the spread so again you can always find a trend to back up either side of the argument here yeah it's all about the matchup and 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 how this game is going to be played styles make fights i do think if there was one guy in the league right now that could make stefan Diggs look maybe slightly average maybe it's sauce Gardner, <laughs> who is grading out right maybe. now as the best cover corner in the league with at least 200 snaps. There's some other corners that have had, you know, lesser snaps that are grading out higher on a shorter sample, but over 200 snaps, which is for the most part, the bulk of the coverage snaps that you're going to see through about eight games. It, Sauce Gardner's grading out better than Patrick Sertan, you know, better than Jalen Ramsey. Wow. So, I mean, he, he one of the best corners in the league, eight games in as a rookie, it's been really impressive. Now, you can scheme against that. We'll see if he's one-on-one matched up with Stefan the whole game. We'll see what that matchup looks like. But the problem for me here with taking the points with the Jets is Zach Wilson, who continues to make terrible decision yeah. after terrible decision. He is the worst graded quarterback in the league under pressure this year. When the stakes get raised, that's when his game wilts under that pressure. And the Patriots defense is very good. I would argue the Bills defense is better. Without Jordan Poyer, that's an injury to keep an eye on. That matters. But like Tank said, he has no running game to help him out. His starting right tackle's mm-hmm. out. His running back's out. They're working in a new running back in James Robinson who got limited run last week and didn't really have an impact. I, I just I don't see a lot of positives here matchup-wise for the Jets. Now, the Jets' defense, like I said, is feisty. They take on the personality of their head coach. They will fight to the last breath. But in the NFL, talent matters a lot. And the talent disparity here is huge. And it's only getting wider with the Jets' injuries. So the only bet to make here, I think, is the Jets and in the under, because I think the total's a little high. I don't see the Jets scoring a ton of points. But I I just do not see the Jets, you know, really matching toe for toe what the Bills can bring to the table in this game. Yeah, the Bills are going to win the AFC, mark my words now. And also the favorite is 4-1 and against the spread in the last five meetings between these two teams. So if you like good trends, take the favorite, laying the points in the Buffalo Bills. Speaking of who the Bills absolutely crushed last week, the Packers. They've lost four straight games to this point as we take it to the NFC North. And the Lions, they just suck in general. The Packers here, only three-and-a-half-point favorites. 
The Lions have right. a five-game losing streak, I know. Wah, wah, wah. Um, and they've lost five of the last six games to the Packers, which is not a good look for the Lions heading into this game, especially after losing Hawkinson, too. And DeAndre Swift, they don't know if he's going to be 100% healthy in this game. The Lions have given up 24 points per game every single game this season. Um, but the good news is the Packers have the seventh worst scoring offense this season. They're only averaging 17.5 points per game during that four game losing streak this total is pretty high though it's set at 49 and a half tank would you lean the under in this spot with the way that the packers offense has been playing or would you lean the over with the way that the lions defense has been playing well first i think we need to note that this may be so the pack the packers have lost what four games in a row this is their first time losing yeah. four games in a row since 2016 and so this is the first time we've seen a line that wasn't like a double digit. You know what I'm saying? Like the Packers were like these double digit mm -hmm. favorites for the three games where they were facing with the Giants, the Jets, and then the yeah. Commanders. And then they were the the double digit dog against uh, Buffalo. And so now we got minus three and a half. And this seems about right. It's just, uh, yeah. That been, yeah. You know, because the, the Detroit Lions, like that's the thing. Like they've looked good on offense at times. They've looked bad on defense consistently. They, they're much more competitive than what their record states. I mean, they've only, like, won one game, but it seems like they should have more wins. Just the way that – the way they look on offense and that the way they're always in it to the very end, and especially against some really good football teams, they play them tough. Uh, so I would expect this game to be competitive as well just for the simple fact that these aren't, like, the Green Bay Packers that we've seen from years past. Like, this is a team that doesn't really have an identity right now. Sometimes they run for a bunch of yards. Sometimes they don't. They started to get some big plays out of some of those young wide receivers. Toure made a big play for them. Romeo Dobbs mm -hmm. made a big play against uh, the Buffalo Bills. And so we're starting to see some sparks in the offense, but can we see some consistency? I think when you go against that Detroit Lions defense, that would allow for some consistency in the run <laughs> and in the past game. So I'm not worried about the Packers Bad. scoring points. And on the flip side, even though the Detroit Lions don't have TJ Hawkinson anymore, they still have Swift. They still have Jamal Williams. They still have Amon Ross St. Brown. They have some of these other wide receivers like Kareem Raymond and uh, Josh Reynolds that can, you know, kind of hold up the fort in that pass game. So I would expect some mm -hmm. points to be scored. So I don't know who's going to win the game, but I'll probably go with the over on this. 49 and a half doesn't seem like too much to me. Yeah. This, the last 13 meetings, the over has hit nine of the last 13 games that they've gone head to head against each other. Jared, do you see that continuing here too? I could. I mean, if there was one defense that could wake up the Packers off. Okay. <laughs> it's Aaron Rodgers. It's the Lions. On, Aaron Rodgers, who historically, sorry, you twist, you twist the knife on my Jets all the time. Now turn about as yeah, fair okay. play. I know, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's I'm a sadist. That is what I've learned family. after a year plus working with <laughs> yeah. her. Thing. That is what I have learned. And it's okay. I'm a Jets fan, so clearly I know pain and okay. I like pain. Um, th there's a lot of th there's a lot of positives I think to take from what the Packers did on on Sunday night against the Bills. And again, they didn't win the game, and they looked a little disjointed at times, especially early in the game mm -hmm. defensively. And we've talked about it on this show. The Packers defense to me has been the more disappointing unit this year. That's the the unit I expected to see some positive you know things from. I knew the offense would be a bit of a struggle, and it's not an explosive offense to begin with. It is more of a ground and pound, kind of five yards in a cloud of dust. Let's take A.J. Dillon, who's kind of the second coming of Corey Dillon, and just pound it into the line and see if we can't get five yards per carry. And then Aaron Jones gets a lot of love on the – I think Aaron Jones might be the best player on that offense, you know, taking Rodgers out of mm -hmm. the equation. But defensively, I want to see more from this – Packers squad and maybe this is the week to do it they're on the road in a familiar environment where they've had success before but they haven't covered a lot against the Lions lately and that's been something that I, I think you take with you you know you get plus three and a half here at home and the Lions have covered more than they've won this year tank nailed it they're one and six straight up but they're three and four against the spread so they've had two games this year where they've covered and, and not won they've exceeded expectations a little bit better against the number than they have straight up so I could see the Lions keeping this close and I could absolutely see Aaron Rodgers finally waking up. Alan Lazard returning to practice. That's huge. We'll keep an eye on the tackle yeah. situation, Jenkins and Bakhtiari as well. That's obviously important for the running game. But I, I, yeah. I could absolutely see Green Bay waking up from their doldrums a little bit offensively this week. 
Yeah, the total is at the over in each of Detroit's last five home games, too. So I feel like the over is a really, really safe yeah. bet in this spot. Um, Mass track. Seahawks, Motor City, on the Cardinals. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Seahawks taking on the Cardinals. The Cardinals lay in at two points here. That total set at 50 and a half. Seahawks, three-game winning streak. Cardinals have lost three of their last four. Geno Smith, and I know Jared's really high on Geno Smith. He's been so good this season. No. He's completing about 73% no. of his passes. Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf have combined for over 1,000 receiving yards and six touchdowns so far through nine weeks. Um, and the Cardinals have lost eight of their last nine games at home. So that's why this line is a little confusing to me. And I think we've seen lines like this a few times so far this season. They're in must-win mode, but them being the favorite here is somewhat weird by the way that they've been playing on both sides of the ball and also the way that they've been playing at home tank. I felt like the Seahawks should have maybe been the favorites here, but I feel like the books are trying to make you – I don't know I don't know what the books are trying to do at this point. Maybe make you jump on the Seahawks, getting a couple points, and then the Cardinals just crush at home. Do you think that they can cover the two-point spread? I mean, this is interesting. I like to hear Jared's point on this because he was talking about how, you know, the Minnesota Vikings, what are they, 6-1? and one? Yeah, at the same time, you yeah. feel like if you look at the stats, like in between, they're probably a little bit more average than what their schedule reflects. And so yeah. now you have an Arizona Cardinals team that went up and they played a 6-1 and one team pretty competitively, had a chance to win at the end of the game. I, I mean, I think you can't admit that the Arizona Cardinals look like a better team now that DeAndre Hopkins is back in the mix. Like, they have a little bit yeah. of a spark on offense, and you feel like they can, you know, connect on some of those third-down situations and some of those red zone situations where in the past they really didn't have a go-to guy. Uh, that being said, like the Seattle Seahawks, I mean, they're a really good football team, and they beat a really good football team. I know you've been high on the New York Giants, and – Rightfully so. I mean, they usually play clean ball. They had some turnovers, special teams that probably led to them losing that game. But it was competitive all the way down to the end. The Seahawks were able to overcome, like, some mistakes on their own. Like, Tyler Lockett fumbling the ball, like, deep Ooh. in their territory, giving the Giants, you know, an easy score. And then Tyler Lockett missing an easy touchdown reception just because bad luck hits off his face mask. So maybe they end up beating the Giants by even more points. But that being said... Gino actually had like the calm and presence going to Tyler Lockett, being like, Hey, yo, you still yeah. the best wide receiver. Like, I'm gonna come to you. And then Tyler Lockett makes a huge play. They're able to go in and score and they ultimately win the game. And so I, I believe, like, we keep talking about Gino on a weekly basis, but he continues to earn more and more credit, not only by his performance, you know, between those white lines, but even when you step on the sideline, yeah. the leadership that he's showing. Like, it's just truly remarkable. And it seems like the players, the coaches, the whole organization is buying in. And so uh, when you just want to speak to, like, the betting angle on this, they only scored 28 points uh, in that first match. I'm not sure if this is the trend that you follow, Jared, but I always like to look at some of these divisional games, and I say, like, oh, if it was a low-scoring affair oh, yeah. in the first matchup, I expect a lot of points in the second matchup. It seems like it typically trends that yeah. way. And so for this total to be 50 and a half, I mean, I would like if it was more so, like, in that 47, 48 raise or something like that, but I would expect this game to be higher scoring more than lower scoring. Uh, and with Arizona being favored by minus two, if you want to go out on the limb, I feel like Seattle's a solid football team. They play well on the road and at home. I mean, I would probably lean towards the Seahawks covering and lean towards an over. But, you know, me, I always like to go with the totals more so than, mm -hmm. you know, picking a certain team. But that's what that would be my leans on both. Yeah, well, the trends like to favor you because the underdog is 12-3-1 against the spread in the last 16 head-to-head -head meetings between these two teams, Jared. Can you see Geno Smith continuing his dominance and also the Cardinals continuing their lack thereof dominance on home home turf? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Tank, I think you really you really analyze this game well because a lot of the things that you're, you said, I'm seeing a lot of data points back it up. Last two weeks, Cardinals offense – trending up, especially with their drop back success rate with Hopkins back in the lineup, not running the ball well though. And that's because the offensive line is just so banged up. I'm looking at the depth chart right now, the entire left side, Humphreys, Garcia, Hudson at center, all yeah. questionable. None of them played last week. Justin Pugh's already on IR. So that's why you saw some very interesting line movement last week. The Sharps loved Arizona early, bet that down to about three and a half. And then you saw the offensive line reports come out Saturday on who was going to play. And then you saw some money come back on Minnesota because it's just really tough to win in the NFL. You're seeing it with the Rams when you have huge injuries at a cluster at one key position. 
And for the left side of the offensive line, that's really important. Now on the other side, mm -hmm. the intangibles that Geno Smith are bringing, it's, you can't quantify it. You can quantify yeah. some of the tangibles, which have been fantastic. His numbers, efficiency, completion percentage, all of that have been way above expectation. And then you look to the sidelines and you see those intangibles and you have to make even more manual adjustments in a positive direction for the impact Geno Smith is having on this Seahawks roster. It is immeasurable, and Seattle is a playoff team. If the season ended today, they're the division champs. So you have to give a ton of credit to what's going on, and I also give a lot of credit to the defense. We talked about it last week, Clint Hurt. That unit's playing a lot better. They held Saquon Barkley to under three yards a carry and Daniel Jones to under six yards per attempt. Listen, the Giants the Giants were going to put up a stinker. It was going to happen. The numbers said it. I know Lauren News kept wanting go ahead, to go back to the you train. Can. No, what? It won this good moment. So I didn't get a I'm chance on Monday's show. I was off on Monday, Tank. I got to get in a little bit here. I got, eventually, the, the, the fun was going to end for this. They just don't have a lot of talent. But now Seattle, Arizona's got a lot more talent offensively. So this is a different game this week. The, you know, the Giants don't have a DeAndre Hopkins. They don't have yeah. a Kyler Murray. So the, 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 the talent discrepancy, big step up in class for the Seattle defense this week. I, I agree, Tank. I do think the total is telling me it's going to be a little higher scoring, and the line movement tells me Seattle's probably going to keep this close. But I kind of think Arizona puts their foot down here. I, I, I think Arizona's a buy low spot. This line opens seven over the summer. Now it's three, less than three. So market says Arizona, but I, I could see Seattle keeping this close. I don't want to tune out the Seattle team. There's too many good things going on with the Seahawks for me to just completely ignore them. Absolutely. And, Can and we also LJ, talk LJ, about them? Even though yeah, even though Jared's getting his digs in, don't worry. Like you're our ray of light every time we get opportunity to. I literally was really like, That's why the really sun is like, kind of shooting through the screen. So what hey. is happening? What is going on? For the on record, here? Tank. For the record, we didn't make a wager on the bet, Lauren and I, on the game. And that's how I knew Seattle was going to win because Lauren and I didn't go head to head. <laughs> she just made her pick and I made my pick and we went along our merry way. I knew Seattle was going to be the right side then. But if we made a <laughs> swing head, you bet your ass, Daniel Jones would have pulled out another game somehow. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens. Jared's in for doing always. swag with me ever again. I'm glad. No I, more that swag. Was like, no more. I'm I done. felt like I was seeing Waving the light the in the tunnel. There was light that was shining in here. I felt like I'm like, <laughs> oh my god what is going on right now um okay one more game to get to before we get to our best bets we have the monday night football game the ravens take it on the saints the ravens are sitting at the top of the afc north right now um they're coming off a thursday night football win against the bucks and then you look at the new orleans saints they're coming off of a huge victory and i mean huge against the raiders they shut them out 24 to nothing i feel like the saints and tank i don't know if you feel the same way they're an underrated team right now in the nfl they rank fifth in yards per play the teams ahead of them are the bills the chiefs the dolphins and weirdly the lions are up there too um they're also in the top one of the top teams in the league at this point third down conversion rate i know the ravens are good offensively but i feel like the saints aren't necessarily getting the love that they deserve they're the two and a half point underdogs here is there a way they upset the ravens in this spot I mean, it's interesting. I, I want to see exactly what that injury report looks like once we get to Sunday. But the Saints shut down a Las Vegas Raiders offense that's pretty good, has a lot of talent on there without Marshawn Lattimore. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's their best cornerback. And Devontae Adams really didn't do anything. And then we just yeah. saw Alvin Kamara just come out and just smack. Like, he had one. I mean, we had a lot of blow-up games in the NFL last week, but Kamara's one definitely stood out given the fact that I expected this game to be a shootout. And then there was like nothing that showed up on the Raiders side of the ball. It was just pure dominance by the New Orleans Saints. And just the way that they closed it out at the very end, just to make sure they sealed the deal, the shutout for Dennis Allen, who was the former head coach for the Raiders. That was just like, okay. Like it seems like the Saints just kind of flipped that switch and it was like, yeah, they were just all in that bag in that matchup against the Raiders. And so now they have to play, a Baltimore Ravens team that, like we said, improved. Now you have a guy like Roquan Smith who's going to be roaming the middle. They hope they can give him mm – -hmm. they hope that uh, he can give them, like, some Ray Lewis-type vibes for that defense that's, you know, giving up a lot of points and spurts here. But um, we don't know if Gus Edwards is going to play. More than likely not because of that hamstring. But Kenyon Drake filled in well, and he's like an explosive player who can get big chunks out with the running game and also catch some balls out of the backfield. 
Not sure what's going to happen with Mark Andrews, but Isaiah likely, like, came in and balled out. And, like, I think he was a huge factor in them being able to pull off that game against Tampa Bay. And also Demarcus Robinson, like, when you lose Rashad Bateman, he stepped up, made some plays, like some run after catch that really impressed me because we're used mm-hmm. to Duvernay being that guy. So even though the Ravens are dealing with some injuries and some key positions, I feel like the guys who filled in for them really didn't miss a beat. So I expect this to be a fairly competitive game. I think both of these teams should be able to score some points uh, because both of these defenses get a little lax at times. Um, so where we're looking at a Baltimore, New Orleans over under at 48. Um, Mm-hmm. They're playing in the dome. Yeah, I mean, I probably, I probably go at the over here. I really don't know who's going to win this game. I see Baltimore minus two and a half. I really don't know how that's going to pan out, but I'll probably go at the over in this one just because I feel comfortable in what both of these teams are doing off of the side of the ball, and also understanding that Andy Dalton could probably throw you some. It, on occasion, Lamar can throw you something. So if you get like a defensive touchdown, that only adds to the totals as well. So turnovers and offensive explosiveness, factoring all those in, like, yeah, the over seems like the play. Yeah, I actually really do like the over in this spot. If you are leaning the Saints, the Saints are 0-4 against the spread, Jared, in their last four Monday night football games. Do they maybe wow. break that cold streak that they've had over the last four in prime time on Mondays? They certainly could. I, I think – this is my favorite game of the week from an entertainment standpoint, because I, I think you have a Ravens team that is maybe, you know, gravitating towards that upper tier contender in the AFC now after the Roquan Smith move and with Lamar mm-hmm. hopefully settling in a little bit again, banged up offensively. That seems to be a broken record for the Ravens, but if they can overcome those injuries, I really like this Ravens team to maybe not win the Super Bowl, but certainly be in a game against Buffalo or Kansas City in the divisional round and make things very interesting. On the other mm-hmm. side, the Saints, they're looking right now in their division standings and they're like, why not us? We got a great defense. We have a veteran quarterback. And mm-hmm. Andy Dalton's numbers, I'm looking at him right now. He's a top 10 quarterback in efficiency. So it's not like he's the reason that they're not winning games. You could say some defensive injuries and some inconsistencies there. And, of course, the injuries on the offensive side of the ball with Michael Thomas and you want to get Jarvis Landry back, but Chris Olave's been good. Tank mentioned Alvin Kamara's ball. And so I am very excited to watch this game. Interconference game on a fast track in New Orleans, prime time. Should be a great atmosphere. You know, little Lamar Jackson college vibes playing in New Orleans, right? So I'm excited to see what we get here, what kind of game this is. If I had to pick it, I would lean Saints at home if you get three. If you can't get three, Mm. I'd probably pass on the side. And I agree. I'd like to see maybe betting from my heart perspective, this game be a little more higher scoring because I think it has a chance to have some, has a chance to be an instant classic if we get one of those games. But Mm -hmm. I I would lean to the over for sure. And I I, kind of hope the Saints win because I want to see the Saints win the division. Four to one. I might get the Saints to win the division this week at four to one. That might not be a bad wager to make considering Tampa Bay struggles and Atlanta being really bad defensively. The NFC mm. South is up for grabs at this point, baby. The Falcons sitting Absolutely. at the top at a good old 4-4 four and four record, 500, and they're at the top <laughs> of the division. And then the Bucks and Saints sitting right below them at 3-5. and five. So that division is up for grabs at this point. We're going to get to our best bets in a second, but first of all, Pixwise Playbook presented by Superbook Sports. Make sure to download the Superbook app or visit Superbook.com right now. And they're going to match your first bet up to $1,000 plus We are rooting for safeties because if you place a $100 pregame bet on any spread or any total at Superbook and there's a safety scored in any game on Sunday, you get a $50 bonus. Make sure to visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions and to sign up for the number one voted sportsbook in Vegas. It's now available at the palm of your hand. Speaking of palm of the hand, Tank, give me your best bet. I want it in the palm of my hand. I want to win some money. Well, we already talked about this game before, uh, but we're going Los Angeles Chargers at Atlanta. We're going over 49. I mean, we already touched on all the key points. You have the Chargers coming off a bye. They're pissed off after losing that game to Seattle. My man touched down Mm -hmm. Jesus, Justin Herbert. He's a week healthier. That rib is a week healthier. He'll finally get (laughs) Keenan Allen back. I think this matchup is perfect for Austin Eckler. He should be able to ball in this one. And if you look at it from the flip side, like, well, also when you speak about Austin Eckler, look what Deontay Foreman did against 
the Atlanta Falcons mm-hmm. like running for yeah. over 100 yards and three tubs. Like that sets up really well for Austin Eckler. And then on the flip side, like Marcus Mariota, he should be getting Cordero Patterson back. He was like number three in rushing before he exited with his injury and was on IR. He actually threw the ball to Kyle Pitts last week. Oh, and they won the game. Kyle Pitts had like over 80 receiving yards, I believe, had a touchdown. And then you also have Drake London, who could be a matchup nightmare for a Chargers defense that won't have J.C. Jackson since he's on IR right now dealing with that knee. And so I really like the setup of both of these teams being able to score some points. So give me that over. Let's do it, baby. Take the over, baby. Points, 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 points. Gerard, who you got for your best bet of the day? The we haven't talked about this game. I wonder why mm. uh, Raiders at Jags. <laughs> I wonder why we haven't wow. put that in the key matchups of the week here. But listen, I've got a nugget for you this week that is the trend of the week. And Let's I hear. love finding these little nuggets because I think trends don't always matter. But in this particular spot, I think it does. And I'll tell you why in a second. Since 2015, teams that are that have gotten shut out the week after are 25, 10, and 3 against the spread. That is a 71% trend. The Raiders wow. got absolutely embarrassed last Crushed. week by the Saints defense. Bagel, zero. They scored as many points as Tank Lauren and I did last week. The week after, <laughs> teams tend to bounce back from those types of embarrassing performances. These are professional athletes we're talking about here. And I like the bounce back vibes. Now, all right, trends aside, let's get into this game and let's try to figure it out. Well, the Jaguars, first of all, something is wrong with Trevor Lawrence because on script last week in the first quarter in London, everything was fine. 70% success rate. Then right at the beginning of the second quarter, he throws just a hellaciously bad interception on the goal line. From that point on, the Jaguars offense, 36% success rate from the second quarter on you can see the confidence just get sucked right out of trevor lawrence's demeanor and the jaguars offense took a nosedive from that point on again i just don't like the body language and i think off script that's where trevor lawrence and this jaguars team really runs into problems and now you're coming back from london we'll see what the travel fatigue looks like and I, i again off the week where the raiders got absolutely embarrassed the one thing, the Raiders offense, you know, they could score points. They've got some pretty good weapons there. Mm-hmm. And the Jaguars mm-hmm. can't stop the run. So I, I just I, I see this getting out of hand for Vegas. You know, I think this is a really spot. I could see this being one of those blowout kind of games for Vegas. But obviously, I don't want to go too nuts. Let's just hope they win and cover the very modest spread of one here. I also think Josh Jacobs, like I said, will have a big game. And on the other side, the Raiders can stop the run a little bit. And that's the one thing that at least Trevor Lawrence has had some running help with Travis Etienne. Even last week they ran it well, but they still couldn't beat the Broncos. So I I like the bounce back vibes for Vegas this week. Trends aside, I think the matchup also favors the Raiders. You heard it here first. Best bets of the show, week nine edition. This has been Pixfly's Playbook presented by Superbook Sports. Watch this, guys. Jared Smith. Tank Williams, reverse, and I point go. in the right direction today. Let's there go. We go. <laughs> Finally, week not, nine weeks in, guys. <laughs> um, make sure to tune in for our week 10 best bets. We'll be back with you. We got about eight more weeks with you, and then we got playoffs. So excited about it. Um, find us on the Pixwise YouTube channel, pixwise.com. Follow us on Twitter. We'll see you guys next week. Pixwise Playbook. Love to see it.